Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we have returning special guest Ton. And what we're going to do for Ton, just like we did for his cousin Khan, is replace his hydraulic brake booster on his 2008 GX470. I don't know what it is with these cousins, but they seem to be having hydraulic brake booster problems. And now Ton needs a replacement because we tried and tried to get his braking better by bleeding it with the TechStream program and we bled it like three separate times and he still has a bad pedal feel. It sinks really low. He doesn't have strong braking. We just got back from Death Valley and he had some scary braking issues. So we're at the point where we've ruled out all the other possibilities. It's the hydraulic brake booster that needs replacing. I'm gonna get Ton up here to describe the braking issue he was feeling and why he wants to replace this. The feeling I was having on my brake pedal is that it had extended travel. Initially, it feels like there's air in the system and then it works really strong and normal for a while. And then all of a sudden, when you gotta stop at a red light, the pedal will go almost down to the floor. You let it go once and pump it and it'll be really strong back to normal again. And so it's a little scary sometimes driving down the hills and whatnot because it'll build pressure as it's going all the way to the bottom and then it feels like you're slamming the brakes every single time. So hoping that this will fix that issue. For jobs like this, I usually like referencing pages out of the factory service manual in order to learn how to do it properly and any helpful tidbits of information that will make the job easier for us. When I went to download information for this job yesterday, I found out that the Tech Info website was down. And I checked this morning and it's still down. And Tom doesn't want to wait to get his brakes working better because it is a little bit dangerous for him. So we're just going to kind of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit here. We already know how to properly bleed the brakes. I have the information on that and that's going to be one of the most important things. And I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to figure out how to get that brake booster out and back in. It's not going to be much different than the job we did for Khan on his 100 series Land Cruiser. So without further ado, we're going to get out to the rig and get started with this job. Just like when we did the hydraulic brake booster replacement on Khan's 100 series Land Cruiser, we're going to want to depressurize the system and we're hoping it's the same procedure on this GX470. So with the key off, I'm going to have Ton jump in and pump the brake pedal about 40 times and he should find that somewhere in the 30s it starts sinking lower and lower and I should be able to see movement of fluid in the brake booster reservoir and then once I stop seeing fluid movement and he feels that pedal sinking, we pretty much know that we've depressurized the system. So here we go. The key is off, no key in the ignition, he's going to start pumping the pedal. Okay, and I'm going to go over to the reservoir and show you what's happening there. With cons, we could see some movement, but we're not seeing anything here, so we'll just keep on going and see what happens. I started pumping the brake pedal, and right after the 11th or 12th pump, I felt the pedal kind of get smooshier and it, it went farther down and then I kept going all the way to 40 and it was the same feel so I'm assuming it's uh, depressurized. We think the system is depressurized and hopefully we're right. Now we're going to want to draw fluid out of the reservoir as much as we can get out. So we're going to limit the mess we make in the engine compartment once we disconnect the lines. It's going to take the cap off and I'm going to use this Minivac fluid extractor. It has a high volume so you can pull out a lot of fluid in just one pull of the lever. There's a little step at the top of this reservoir so I don't know how well it's going to work to draw fluid out but we'll try our best. Huh, not much. We're just going to put this in a container here. Yeah, it's pretty much worthless. Because of the way the reservoir is made, it's got a barrier to where you can't get the tube very deep in the reservoir. So we're just gonna go to the next step and start cracking loose lines. All right, we're gonna break free all these lines. There's four of them. If you're worried about getting them back in the right position, you can mark them in some sort of fashion, but we don't think we'll mix these up because just of the way they bend and the length of them, we won't mistakenly connect them to the wrong connection. You're gonna to wanna to use a flare nut wrench for these and it's gonna be a 10 millimeter size. If you use a regular open end wrench, you have a higher chance of stripping the nut. So use a flare nut. 
You'll notice that we have some rags underneath here because brake fluid is pretty corrosive. It will eat up paint. And you'll also notice right here, I've got a fender protector here. So in case I drip any brake fluid, it's not going to eat up Ton's paint and make him cry like a baby. Here we go. Lefty Lucy, break it free. Okay, that one's broken free. What we're going to do to limit the loss of fluid is we're going to put a 732nd vacuum cap over the flared end of the tubing. And then we're going to use a small silicone plug to plug the port on each of the holes on the master cylinder. Okay, I got that one loose. I'm going to get my 732nd vacuum cap, slide it over the end of the tubing. I think I need a bigger one, but let me plug this first because it's dripping. That's plugged off. I'm going to get a bigger vacuum cap because it seems the 732nd isn't big enough. Okay, I'm going to go to a quarter inch size vacuum cap. That slips over really easy, but hopefully it's going to stop the flow. Okay, there's one, and we're going to do the same with the other four. You don't need to see it. Break it free, get it loose, slip over a quarter inch vacuum cap over the line, and then plug the port on the master cylinder with a silicone plug. All right, we have all four lines disconnected. One thing that might assist you is once you break free the fitting with the flare nut wrench and you find that the fitting is a little sticky and it's not going to spin out with your fingers, then using an open end 10 millimeter will expedite you being able to turn it lefty loosey and get it all the way loose because resetting a flare nut wrench multiple times is going to be really tedious. So I suggest switching to an open end wrench if you find that the fitting isn't just coming out really easy with your fingers. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to disconnect these electrical connections to the hydraulic brake booster. There's three of them. One here, one here, and one here. This one on the front has the release mechanism facing towards the inside. I'm going to squeeze it and pull back. This first one on the driver's side has the release tab on the top. Push that in and pull back. Now this one is an interesting one. You have to slide out this mechanism here and slide it towards the front to where you can disconnect this connection. I'm gonna use a small flat screwdriver to help me with that. So I'm just gonna get underneath this lip, pull back a little bit. Got a little bit of movement. There we go. And you'll see that this thing starts to slide out. There we go. Pull it out a little more. And you can see what that connection looks like. So this thing just slides into place and captures some posts on the top and bottom of this connector here. So now all three electrical connections are disconnected. Now we're gonna go on the inside of the vehicle and we're gonna get underneath the dashboard to disconnect a few things so we can pull this sucker out. To have easier access to get the clip disconnected so we can remove the hydraulic brake booster plunger from the brake pedal and to get access to the four nuts that holds the brake booster to the firewall, we're gonna take this panel off. I'm sure some people could do it without that, but we're filming and we wanna be able to show you a better picture of what we're doing, so we're gonna get this panel off. There is one screw right here that I'm gonna disconnect. You can call it a Phillips or a JIS, Japanese Industrial Standard and that's disconnected. There's a clip right here for this bottom piece to connect to this panel. You can just pull that out and then get that out. Electrical connector, and I'm gonna pull that out. Now we have this bottom panel out of the way. There's a 10 millimeter bolt here. I'm gonna remove with my Milwaukee ratchet, a short extension and a 10 millimeter socket. There's something hanging us up right here. So that means we're gonna have to get this panel pulled out of the way. And to get this panel pulled out of the way, we're gonna have to pull this panel up. So I'm just gonna use a trim removal tool out of this kit right here. I'm gonna get underneath here and pry up. We've got a foot rest in our way. I'm gonna try to pop this up. It should just pull up. At least they do on other rigs. Maybe not, maybe not so easy. There we go. I got this underneath there and pulled back firmly. These clips fit in there pretty tight. So you can see the two posts and you can see the two clips that it slides over. There's a plug right here that's holding this panel to the floorboard. 
I think it's just a friction one, but maybe it's a screw on. Yep, it was a screw on one. So now that's free. Now we should be able to pull this back. Now with that side panel out of the way, it exposes a 10 millimeter bolt that I'm gonna remove with my gun. Okay, that feels like it's everything on the bottom. One additional thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this weather stripping out a little bit because this panel is gonna to have to come clear of it. So I'm just gonna leave it just like that. Now we have some fasteners on the top. There's some hidden fasteners right behind this wood grain trim. I'm gonna get underneath here with my plastic trim tool pry out a little bit and you can see it exposes a 10 millimeter bolt here so I'm gonna zip that one out to see where we're at here okay I could tell that's free so I think that might be the last fastener I'm gonna have to go to the ignition side now and get that top part free I'm gonna get this disconnected on the upper corner I'm gonna get in here with my trim removal tool see if I can pop this free there we go. Okay, you don't want to pull down with a lot of force now. You have to disconnect several electrical connectors to get the panel free. Starting near the ignition, I'm going to pop this one out. It just pops in with a couple light tabs. You could just easily pull this sucker out. If you had to, you might have to get a little trim removal tool or a screwdriver to pry out the tabs. And we got this one disconnected. There's one right here that we have to disconnect. The release tab is facing towards the driver's side. Got that one disconnected. Then there's one more down here. Looks like the release tab is facing up. And that one's disconnected. That's everything on the right side of the panel. Now let's go to the left side. This one right here appears the release mechanism is facing the inside. We're having difficulty with this one. And we're gonna try to get this one disconnected first and get it out of the way. The release tab is facing towards the driver's side. I'm gonna use my spudger tool to help me out here. It's not much to grab onto. That's what she said. I can't get the sucker out. Even this one's a little difficult. You push the release mechanism and then maybe get in there with a plastic tool like the spudger tool we have or a screwdriver and pry underneath. There we go. I'm gonna disconnect this plug by pushing the tabs and pushing it out the front. Okay, you could see the little push tabs you have to push and you could get this out of the way. Now, we're gonna try to work on this one and get this sucker out. There we go. I think I was pushing on the wrong thing. This part right here is the release mechanism. Got that one out, finally. Below that one, got that one. The release mechanism was facing the driver's side. Same with this one, the blue one is facing the driver's side. Same with this one. The plugs don't have a lot to grab onto up above the clip, so that's what's causing me some grief here. There we go. And finally, the last one here, this back one. All right, we got all the connectors finally disconnected. Now we gotta figure out how to disconnect these release mechanisms. They're a little bit different than on the 100 series Land Cruisers and other ones that I've seen where it's held on with a screw. These are just clips. So it looks like the release mechanism is right here. You could push it with your finger. I'm gonna use my spudger tool. You push in and then you could slide it backwards. And that's it, that's pretty easy. And then we're gonna do the same with this one. That was the gas hatch. This is the hood release. There we go. Now they're both free. Now we can finally get this panel out of our way. I'm underneath the dash and I'm looking on the right side of the brake pedal and you can see the clevis pin right here or whatever you want to call it. And it's a unique looking one. It's a little bit different than ones I've seen on other rigs. So I'm going to get in there with a straight nose needle nose pliers, but it looks like I might have to also get in there with a screwdriver to push the end of the clip over the top of the rod to where it will pull out. I don't know if we're capturing this, but I've got the needle nose pliers on the end of the clip and I'm gonna use a screwdriver to help push that end up over the rod and then slide it out. So you can see how this was formed. I was pushing this end of the clip with my screwdriver because it was hooked over the end of the rod. So by pushing it away from me, I was able to slide this end of the clip over the rod and then I was able to pull this free. Now with the clip out of the way, I could slide this pin out from the passenger side towards the driver's side and that's gonna free the plunger of the hydraulic brake booster from the brake pedal. And there's the pin. It looks like the brake booster is held on with four 12 millimeter flange nuts, two towards the passenger side and two facing the driver's side. I'm gonna get in there with some long extensions and maybe a swivel 
and take all those out. I'm going for the upper left one first. I've already got the socket on there. I'll show you the extensions and the swivel in the socket after I break this free. Okay, I got it loose. Now I'm gonna transition to my gun and zip it out the rest of the way. Maybe not. I'm choosing just do it with my hand because the ratchet's kind of flopping it around too much. I first had two extensions, but I think that's probably overkill. You can get away with one long extension, about a 12 incher, a uh, 3 8 swivel, and a deep 12 millimeter socket. That's the flange nuts that you're getting loose. The bottom left one won't be as hard. I again broke it free first with a 3 8 ratchet. And now I'm gonna spin it out the rest of the way with the Milwaukee ratchet. You just have to know that when you're using a swivel, it kind of goes a little funky. So just go gradual and gently. Okay, got another one out. Now we're gonna work on the ones facing the passenger side. Okay, okay I'm on the top one on the inside. Got it loose. You know what, forget the gun. I'm just gonna spin it out with my hand. To get access to the ones on the inside, you could reach around the steering column and get your hand in there. Okay, and now for the final one. To get access to those ones on the inside, you have to go in between the brake pedal and the steering column. Okay, that was the final one. This hydraulic brake booster should pull out. From the experience we had doing it on the 100 series Land Cruiser, these lines are gonna fight us a little bit. I'm gonna see if I could just bend them out of the way a little bit. These are nice and floppy, so let's see if I can lift this thing out. Okay, that one's gonna hook. This one's hooking us. What else is hooking us? Something else is stopping us. Is that brake line? Oh, that brake line's hooking us below. There we go. I know the brake line's hooking us again. There we go. So just like the experience we had with the 100 series Land Cruiser, getting the hydraulic brake booster out is only hard because of the lines hooking you as you're pulling it out. So if, if you pay attention to where the lines are hooking onto the hydraulic brake booster, you can slip this thing out pretty easily. And it helps to have a extra set of hands. Ton was actually filming and helping push the lines out of the way as I was pulling this out of the engine. In preparation to getting the new hydraulic brake booster in, you're gonna wanna check the flared ends of the tubings for any loose debris. And here's one example. You see this little strip of material? There's a little bit of the, I don't know what you call it, the anodizing of the metal tube, or it could be a slight sliver of metal. So you wanna rub your fingers over the flared tubing ends to make sure there's no debris. So you guarantee you're gonna get a nice leak-free connection with the brake booster. So this one looks good. I'll put the cap back on. Let's see what this one looks like. I don't know if you could see that in the video, but there's just a little sliver of junk there. And that one's cleaned off too. You could probably see it on the rag right here. It's that little sliver of junk. Do that with each connection to make sure you don't have any debris that's gonna hinder a good connection. Yeah, there's a little junk on this one too. It's almost like the coating on the line itself. It's like some type of coating that could flake off. Okay, you get the idea. We're gonna just work at this. These hydraulic brake boosters come with a new gasket that seals the brake booster to the firewall. It's basically a moisture barrier. So if water was getting in there, maybe when you're washing your car, you're in a good rainstorm or you went through a big puddle, it's gonna be a barrier to where water can't sneak into your cabin area. We do know the part number for this. If you were pulling out your brake booster for some other reason and you needed to replace it, we'll provide that part number in the video description. I'm gonna slide this sucker in. We're gonna dive in like this, like a submarine going underneath the surface. The main thing is Again, the lines are gonna be messing with you. You gotta get the holes lined up. We're trying this a second time. Ton is helping me by pulling the lines towards the engine. And I'm gonna see if I can get this thing started better. There we go. Now that we got this in there pretty good, I'm gonna go underneath the dashboard and just double check that we have a good orientation of the plunger of the hydraulic brake booster with the brake pedal. 
I got underneath the dash and I aligned the plunger of the brake booster with the brake pedal and I slid the pin in from the driver's side towards the passenger side and then I got that clip into the hole on the pin. We didn't try to show up because it's just too hard to get the camera in there and for me to be able to get my hands in there to do the work. I got all four flange nuts started just with my hand. On the passenger side, again, I reached around the steering column. I was able to get them both started with my hand, and then it was a little bit easier to get the ones on the driver's side started. Now I'm gonna tighten them up with the same extension swivel and 12 millimeter deep socket. There is a torque spec for it, but since we can't get a straight shot, we're not gonna be able to get an accurate torque spec. So I'm gonna use that spec we all know and love, good and tight and call it good. So just use your best judgment. You don't have to use a crazy amount of force, but just use the right amount of force you think is necessary to hold that brake booster firm against the firewall. We tighten the four 12 millimeter flange nuts that firmly holds the brake booster to the firewall. Now we're gonna get our line connections made again. The new brake booster is gonna have plastic plugs to protect the threads on the brake booster. You just have to unscrew it. We're gonna get our lines connected. So. Pull off the vacuum cap, and then this might be a test of patience, but hopefully if you didn't bend the lines too much, you'll be able to get them all started. That one started really nicely. I'm gonna get this next one started. It helps if you wiggle the line a little bit. Maybe use two hands. Okay, that one started. I think I got this one started. This one's a little sticky. Then I'm gonna go to this one. I wanna get this bottom one a little bit better. Back it out and start over again? No, it's gone. I got it now. Okay, those are all started quite a bit. Now I'm gonna cinch them up with the open end wrench and then do the final tightening with the flare nut wrench. We'll come back once I have them all cinched up with the open end wrench. All right, I have all four flare nuts touched down with the open end. Now I'm gonna do the final tightening with the flare nut. How tight you get these? Well, use your best judgment. Okay, those are all good and tight. Now we're gonna make the electrical connections. We've got the one on the front. Snap it in, pull back, make sure you got it fully connected. That one's good. And then we got the funky one. You wanna start with this thing pulled out. I disconnected these because I just learned that the routing is better when these two connectors are on the inside of this bigger connector. So just follow our lead on that. You wanna have this sleeve fully out, line it up, push it in quite a bit, and then start pushing this in. There we go. You have to mess with it a little bit, but you'll finally get it to where you could slide this sleeve in, capturing both the posts, and now it's locked in. So that's all the electrical connectors reconnected. The next thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna get the panel back connected and make all the necessary electrical connections to that panel so all the switches will work like they're supposed to. We got all the panels put back on that we took off to get access to disconnect the hydraulic brake booster from the firewall. I apologize, we usually show all the steps of putting everything back together, but we are on a little bit of a crunch time for this job because I got to get somewhere and so does Ton. And so we figured if you took the panels off and made all the electrical disconnects, you can get them all back reconnected. It's not that hard. So now we're gonna go through the brake bleeding procedure and we topped off the master cylinder to the maximum line with some fresh brake fluid. We're not using synthetic DOT3, we're just using regular DOT3. We're gonna go through the steps that the factory service manual instructs to do using the TechStream program. So here we go. All right, we're ready to start the bleed procedure. The first step is you turn the ignition key on and you top off the reservoir to the max line. We start with the front brakes, right front and then left front. Tom's gonna get in the rig with the ignition key on, he's gonna pump the brake pedal about five times, he's gonna hold it firm. And then I'm gonna get on the bleeder on the right front caliper, and I'm gonna open it up and bleed out some air and some fluid, and we're gonna keep on doing that sequence. So he's gonna pump the brake pedal, hold it. I'm gonna open the bleeder. The pedal's gonna to sink to the floor. I'm gonna 
close the bleeder off, and then tell Tom to release and do it again. He's got to pay attention to what I'm telling him. He can't lift up the brake pedal when I have the bleeder open, or that's going to allow air to suck into the caliper, which is what we don't want to do. So the person at the brake pedal has to pay attention to what the person at the bleeder is telling him. To make it easier for me to get at that right front brake bleeder, I'm gonna have Ton turn on the vehicle and I'm gonna have him turn the wheels all the way to the left. And that's gonna allow me to get in there easier to get to that caliper bleeder. All right, I'm on the inside of the front right wheel. You have the bleeder on the top of the caliper. A lot of times there'll be a protective rubber cover. You could just pull that off with your fingers or maybe a little screwdriver to help you get it loose. You're gonna want some type of system like this, a catch container and then some vinyl tubing that will slip over tightly over the nipple. To open the bleeder, I'm gonna use my offset 10 millimeter wrench. I'm gonna slip the wrench over the fitting first, and then I'm gonna get the tubing connected. Okay, I've got the tubing connected. Now Ton is gonna turn the ignition key on, and then he's gonna pump the brake pedal five times and hold it. Pump and hold, tell me when you're holding. holding. Okay, do it again. For this bleeding procedure, you just want to keep on doing it. Pump the pedal about five times. He holds it. You open up the bleeder and you're going to see air and fluid come out. And you just want to keep on doing that until you see no more air coming out. We're almost done with this side, but we're going to do it a few more times. Go ahead and pump it up, Ton. Holding. Lower. Okay, pump it up. Holding. Lower. Pump it up. Holding. Floor. Okay, I think that's good. I don't see any more air coming out. During this bleeding procedure, you wanna make sure that you don't go below the minimum. So you have to be mindful that you do the bleeding procedure several times at one wheel, but then you make sure you go back to the master cylinder pretty regularly to top it off to the max line while you're doing this. You don't wanna go below the minimum because if you go too low, then you might be sucking air into the master cylinder, which basically cancels out the work you're trying to do. So always make sure you're between the minimum and maximum when you're doing this bleeding procedure. All right, we're done with the right front. Now we're gonna do the left front and I'm gonna have Ton now start the vehicle and turn the wheels all the way to the right. And now I'm gonna do the same procedure with the left front. He's gonna pump the brake, hold it. I open the bleeder, pedal goes to the floor. He holds it there. I close off the bleeder and then I let him know to start pumping again. And we're gonna keep on doing this left front until I see no air coming out of that bleed nipple. And then we're gonna go to the rear, which is a little bit different of a procedure because you don't have to pump the pedal. You just have to hold firm pressure on it. For the rear brakes, all Ton has to do is have the key in the on position and he puts pressure on the brake pedal. And when I open the bleeder, the pedal is not gonna sink to the floor. It's just gonna be powering the brake booster to be sending fluid to the back brakes. So he's just gonna put his foot on the pedal and hold it there. I'm gonna open the right rear bleeder first. And then when I see no more air coming out and just solid fluid, then I'm gonna close off the bleeder and then we're gonna move to the left rear. You just again have to be mindful how much fluid you're moving and you don't empty out the master cylinder. So I'm gonna move a decent amount of fluid, then I'm gonna close off the bleeder and then I'm gonna go back to the master cylinder and top it off and keep on doing that until I don't see any more air coming out of that right rear and then we'll move to the left rear. For the rear calipers, the bleeder's right here. It faces towards the back of the vehicle and it's the same thing. I'm gonna get my offset wrench on there first and then I'm gonna connect up the vinyl tubing and then we're gonna get going. I'm not gonna show it. It's hard for me to be holding the camera and doing the bleeding at the same time. All right, we're done with the manual bleeding of all four wheels. Now we have to use the TechStream program to do the next step. Again, we're gonna start with the front brakes. Front right and then the front left, then the right rear and then the left rear. So I've got my little Dell laptop with the TechStream program on it and we have to connect up the computer to the OBD2 port with the cable. And then we're gonna walk you through the steps that the factory service manual instructs you to do with the TechStream program. Here we go. 
Okay, I've got the TechStream program loaded. I'm gonna have Tom turn the ignition key on, and then I have to click on the top button that says connect the vehicle, and it's doing its thing. And then it automatically noticed that it's a Lexus GX470 2008 with a 2UZ FE engine. And then the option, what's the option we could select? Let's see. Do you have KDSS? No. So we're gonna say without KDSS. So then we'll click on next. So then this screen pops up. We want to go to chassis. This button right there. Click on chassis. And then we go to ABS VSC track. And then we got to go to the bottom here and click on this arrow in the bottom right. And then it says to ensure proper communication be sure engine is idling if you have a vsc vehicle do we have a vsc vehicle yes we do we have a vsc vehicle okay so he's gonna have to turn the ignition on okay i'll click okay and now i go to utility on this left side here and then i go to the top and i click on air bleeding and then I gotta go to the bottom right and click on the arrow. Okay, finally loaded. And it says, welcome to the air bleeding utility. This function is used to purge air from the hydraulic braking system. Note, when bleeding, ensure that the fluid level does not drop below the indicated minimum line on the reservoir. So press next to proceed. Here we go with the steps. So you start off with the front right, then the front left, then the right rear, and then the left rear. I click on the front right, and then I click on next. And then it says, note, the bleeding operation on the next screen will automatically stop after four seconds. And that's so the solenoid doesn't get overheated. So it's gonna operate for four seconds, and then there's a resting period of 20 seconds. So it says, press next to proceed. And then it says, perform the following operations. Press and hold the brake pedal. And then you press next and you wait for the timer. So Ton's holding the brake pedal firm. I'm gonna click on next. And you could actually hear the brake booster operate. And so the pedal went to the floor and then now he releases the brake pedal. I click on next. And then we have to wait 20 seconds, it's resting. So in this procedure, you're not opening up a bleeder for the front brakes. You're just operating the solenoid and it's pushing air and fluid back to the master cylinder. So the factory service manual instructs, because you can't actually see the air moving, they say to do this at least 10 times per front wheel. So we're gonna do this same procedure for another nine times. So we'll show it one more time. So I'm gonna click on next. I'm gonna have to click on the front right line again, click on next again, and then I'm gonna click next, and then he's gonna hold the brake pedal, and then I'm gonna click next again, and it's gonna operate. Pedal went to the floor, the timer stopped, released the brake pedal, and then I click on next, and then we have to wait the 20 seconds, and we're gonna keep on doing this. All right, we have the front brakes bled using the TechStream program. Now for the rears, we're again gonna have the engine running because it's a VSC vehicle, but now Ton doesn't have to actually press the brake pedal. All he has to do is operate the TechStream program for me while I'm under the rig. Let's show what the instructions say in the program so you'll see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna click on the right rear and then click on next. And then it says, note, the bleeding operation on the next screen will automatically stop after four seconds, just like the front. So then you click on next. Here's the steps. I open the bleeder plug. Ton's gonna be inside the rig and he's gonna press next for me. And then the timer's gonna operate for four seconds and the fluid's gonna flow. It says, do not press the brake pedal. So that's gonna be the operation. And then when we do that, we're gonna to have to close the bleeder off and then wait that 20 seconds. So I'm not gonna operate it just yet. I'm gonna to have Ton film the procedure that you're seeing in the program while I'm back underneath the rig opening and closing the bleeder. All right, open the bleeder plug. Okay, bleeder's open. Okay, I'm gonna press next. Okay. And then we're gonna wait for the timer. Okay. It's going. 
Close it. Close it? Yep. Okay, close. Okay, now I press next and wait 20 seconds. It's resting. Okay, air bleeding is complete. Press next. Remember, you gotta keep on selecting right rear. Select right rear again. Press next. The bleeding operation on the next screen will automatically stop after four seconds. All right, open the bleeder plug. Bleeder's open. Okay, pressing next. It's going. Close it. Close. All right, resting, 20 seconds. All right, right rear again. Go next, next. Open. Open. Press next, going. Close it. Hey, check the level. All right, resting, checking the levels. All right, for the rear brakes, we just decided to do about five rounds per rear wheel. We didn't really see any air come out at all, but we just played it safe and did five rounds with each rear wheel, and then we called it good. Now Ton's gonna go on a test drive, and hopefully he's gonna report that his braking is really improved and we did a good thing by replacing his hydraulic brake booster. He's gonna take it off for a decent test drive and report back. So Ton got back from his test drive and he reported that the braking is much better. But one thing that we didn't anticipate was some lights came on in his dash. The VSC track light came on, the VSC off light came on, and then the one that's the little squiggly, like I guess it's traction control, those three lights came on and then we were wondering how do we deal with this and get these lights to turn off well we used the tech stream program to get rid of them and we're going to show you how we did that so under the same abs vse traction live tab you'll see a code and the description we took a picture of that code and now we'll show you on ton's phone so the code was C as in Charles 1336. And the description was zero point calibration of deceleration sensor undone. So then we did a Google search on how we can get rid of that and we found a helpful link. So you would go to the left of the screen and go to the utility tab and click that. And then you'd go to the upper right side and it says reset memory. And so you would click on that. And then you go down to the bottom right and you click on the arrow to proceed. And then it says, welcome to the reset memory utility. This function is used to clear the learned memory of the ABS ECU if the following components are replaced. The ABS ECU, the yaw rate, and the G sensor. So then you would click next and then you want the vehicle stop and the ignition on. And you press next. Once you do that, then you get another screen. It says, please perform the following operations. You turn the ignition switch off. You wait three seconds and then you turn the ignition switch back on. And that should reset the memory. But when we did that, it cleared the code. But then as soon as Ton started up the vehicle and started to move it, the lights would come on. And it was because we needed to do one other step. And that step is you have to go back to the previous screen and you have to click on test mode. And you then click on the arrow in the bottom right. And then it says, Welcome to the test mode wizard. This function is used to calibrate the yaw rate sensor after replacement of the following components. The ABS ECU, yaw rate, G sensor. And then you click on next. And then it gives you some instructions. It says confirm the following conditions. Vehicle is on level surface. Steering wheel is in the straight ahead position. The shifter is in park. The engine is not running and the ignition is on. So we do have it on pretty level ground on my garage. The wheels are pointed straight ahead. We do have it in park. The engine is off and the ignition is on. So then we click next. And it says wait for about five seconds. Keep the vehicle stationary for two seconds or more. If there is the instruction for the waiting time in the repair manual, please follow it. Press next to proceed. And then when the ABS and VSC lights blink, the calibration is complete. And we'll show you what that looks like. And now I'm just gonna click on exit and then those lights should turn off. There it is. So Todd and I are of the opinion because we replaced that hydraulic brake booster, which has the ABS module on it, that you're gonna have to go through that procedure that we just outlined with the TechStream program to get rid of those lights. 
So there it is there. Hopefully it's gonna be pretty straightforward since we went through that process with you. All right, we are all done with this job of replacing the hydraulic brake booster on Ton's 2008 GX470. It's pretty straightforward other than the fact that you really need that TechStream program to properly bleed the brakes. I know there's guys out there that have some other way to do it without the program and they say it works, but since I do have the program and I wanna show people the proper way to do it, I'm not gonna do some other type of hack method that works because brakes are pretty important. They stop you from crashing into things, so I'm not gonna go down the road of showing some hack method that allows you to bleed the brake booster properly without the program. Ton's initial test drive showed that the braking was much better, but he's gonna get some more driving time and be able to determine, yes, that the brakes are working really well, or maybe not, and the pedal's gonna start sinking to the floor again on them. Hopefully not, but I'll update the video description and give an update that, yes, the braking is operating perfectly, or no, maybe there's some other issue that we haven't yet uncovered that's causing his braking problem. So hopefully, fingers crossed, everything is now good to go for him. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Ton. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Sick mods and sick hydraulic brake booster replacements on a GX470. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Bye-bye.